There we go. Hello. Thank you for joining us today at Northwest Passages. My name is Arielle Dreyer, and I cover healthcare for the Spokesman Review, and I'm supported by Report for America. Um, if you have any questions during this live stream with our special guest today, um, I'm told that there's a box on the right hand of the screen that you can submit questions, and I will get to them at the end of my conversation. Um, today, I am really excited um, to be in conversation with our Secretary of Health, Dr. Umer Shah. Um, he comes to us from Texas, and he joined the Department of Health at arguably one of the most difficult times um, to join in leading the state's pandemic and primarily vaccination efforts. So thank you so much, Dr. Shaw, for being here. Ariel, thanks for having me. I hope you can hear me okay. Yep, loud and clear. Um, I'd love, Dr. Shaw, if you could just start um, with your transition. I mean, you really jumped in to, <laughs> you, you sort of addressed the pandemic in Harris County, and then you were, you were going along, and all of a sudden there's a vaccine, and then you're all of a sudden leading a new state's Department of Health. How did that work for you? <laughs> you know, there are probably a lot of words to describe someone who takes on that kind of a, a role or responsibility in the midst of that. Uh, you know, the joke that I that I used, which was not funny, was that I finished at Harris County at 7 p.m. on a Friday night. I took a long vacation of two days and I almost <laughs> did an ER shift on that Saturday. Um, and uh, one of my colleagues said, don't, don't do that. You need some time to decompress and transition. And then on Monday, I was on a flight to Seattle. And so, it, you know, it was tough. It was a challenge both uh, professionally and, and absolutely um, personally, there's no doubt. And uh, the professional challenge was such that, you know, we were, as you said, in the midst of a, not just a, a pandemic, but at a really critical time as the solution, if you will, the long-term solution to how to get out of the pandemic was the vaccines and really making that um, that jump at a time where everybody was so focused on COVID-19 vaccines, I think was a real critical piece that that really is, is was something that was really uh, important for all of us at the same time. So I do think that there were a lot of challenges um, and it may not have been the I ideal timing, but you know, as they say, it is what it is and then you move on. Definitely, definitely. Um, how have you found, this is just a, a my curiosity question. How, are you, how have you found um, your job is the same or different than what you were doing in the Houston, Houston area, right? That's right. Um, different in the sense that, you know, I mean, you know, obviously Houston Harris County is a huge community. It was about uh, or is about five million people spread over the size of uh, Rhode Island, just smaller than the state of Delaware. So not a small uh, jurisdiction by any stretch of the imagination and, and obviously very diverse, uh, very urban, but also suburban and rural in nature, uh, red and blue. Uh, issues and concerns, and you know when you when you put that all into uh, into a factor of of course I was at the local level, not the state level, and then making the transition, even going from that local to state, but then coming to a state that was larger, uh, absolutely geographically, but population wise, you know our our region, Houston Harris County and beyond actually rivals uh, because it had about 8 million people, uh, the, you know, the state of Washington. And then certainly the red blueness of, of things and the east west divide at times, which isn't, uh, I'm learning a completely accurate depiction of, of the state, um, really uh, underscored the fact that uh, regardless of what you're doing in public health, you are still responding to um, the, the, the same things wherever you are, which is to, to make sure people understand the importance of health, uh, the value proposition of public health, and really at the end of the day to fight a crisis. And I think so some of those themes were the same, even though they were in completely different geographic, you know, heat, <laughs> hurricanes, mosquitoes, uh, mountains, uh, rain, or, you know, topography east that was different, uh, very different um, uh, stratosphere, and yet the themes were actually quite similar. That's awesome. Um, I'm curious to, you know, we were at this, and I'm not going to make you recap the last six months. I hope some readers have read my stories <laughs> and read your quotes in my stories. Um, yeah, please don't. We're, please we're don't. <laughs> at this, <laughs> we're at this point in the pandemic, and you've said this term a couple times the last few weeks, 
um, where we really don't want to get into the tale of two cities or the tale of two sides of a state um, when it comes to vaccine coverage. And I'm curious if you can break that down for me a little bit, because I think it applies on a much more micro level too. Obviously, from your perspective, you're looking at the state level. But even when we drill down into certain counties, you know, some rural regions um, might not have the access. I was at one rural clinic a few weeks ago in Fairfield, and that was their first clinic, you know, ever there. And so I'm curious if you can talk a little bit about the, the tale of two cities um, problem and sort of what the Department of Health is doing. I know you just launched the caravan initiative, so I'd love to hear about that a little bit more. But um, solutions to sort of work through that, because I think this next part of the correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the next part of vaccine campaigns is the hardest part. I think the next part's the hardest part. Yeah, you know, we've we've done an amazing job over some 7 million doses that have been administered and, you know, so much of our population, more than half the population that's that's been vaccinated. And, it, you know, I, I don't think uh, uh, if I if I even think back to January 3rd, I remember that of all the vaccines that were coming into the state, only 29% were getting out into the arms of Washingtonians. And now it's, well, it, you know, to be honest, it's at a point where we don't even count that uh, number anymore because it's it's actually not as important as it is the, the true numbers of people that are getting vaccinated rather than the percentage of the supply that's being used because there's ample supply now. Um, the, right. the concept of tale of two cities or, you know, obviously the, you know, kind of the, the literature for those who are readers know the tale of two, it's like a book club. So tale of two cities, really it's that <laughs> it's the tale of two societies. And that's what, you know, I, I don't want to um, underappreciate. I think it's probably the best word for it. So on the one hand, um, you have people who are vaccinated, fully vaccinated, who are partaking in activities, they're doing things they're but they're doing them and they're safe. They're, they're able to do that with safety in mind, with their health in mind. Uh, they go to the grocery store. They don't have to worry. They, they go, you know, to, to even a crowded event. And by and large, they're, they're protected. And yet you also then have other people who are not vaccinated, who are, in essence, watching all these people doing those things. And then, again, falsely thinking that, well, because others are doing it, I'm protected. And so they're out and doing the same things, not having their mask on, you know, going about the same grocery store, or going into a crowded situation. But the person A is protected and, and able to go through those situations without concern by and large for infection. But person B who's unvaccinated can go through those same activities. And now you have a tale of two societies where that individual is now at risk for hospitalization and even for um, um, a severe uh, outcome. And we've shown, and Ariel, I think you've seen this over the last uh, few media briefings, that if you are uh, uh, even today, we talked about if you're between the age of 45 and 64, that you have a 21 time increased risk of hospitalization if you are um, unvaccinated versus vaccinated. If you're 65 and above, uh, it is a 13 uh, time increase. So you're looking at a 10 to 20 time increased risk of being hospitalized if you're not uh, vaccinated. And so we are going to start to see, and I, I'm really concerned about this, that we're going to start to see this real society, not just in Washington, but across the country uh, and even across the globe of people who are vaccinated, again, safe and protected, and those who are unvaccinated who are going to partake in activities, but they're really still as much at risk as we were back in 2020. And that's the biggest concern that we have. Definitely. Thank you. Um, I, I I asked that before I asked this next question, because I think it leads into that. Um, the rest of this year, from my conversations with multiple epidemiologists, yourself, Scott Lindquist, everyone who's tired of answering my questions, um, the, the, the trajectory, if you will, of the rest of this year depends a lot on our vaccination status, if I'm understanding what I'm hearing correctly. And I'm curious if you can talk a little bit and if it's easier to have this conversation in terms of variants and sort of what a new variant that does, um, I don't want to say more damage, but is more effective at getting around vaccines could pose. Um, but what sort of risks, I guess, um, 
do you see and sort of how important is it that the current stage of the vaccine campaign like goes incredibly well in order to sort of not have some of those potential consequences down the road? Um, and I also am curious, and this can be a follow-up question, but about the possibility of a booster shot and sort of if we need to start getting people comfortable with the idea that perhaps next fall, maybe late next winter, like you might need a booster shot and that like might end up being a thing that everyone needs to. Well, you know, I think recently there was this uh, a little bit of the confusion about, uh, you know, with the CDC putting out guidance that for the most part, you could not uh, have your masks in most settings if you were vaccinated. And, uh, you know, people were really concerned and confused by what that meant. And I, I quibbled, as you know, very much about how the CDC went about and putting this out there, because I think it's important for us to always be connected and proactive about working with state and local partners, because ultimately we're the ones who have to operationalize the guidance. And uh, we didn't get a lot of heads up on it. In fact, we, we, we got maybe about an hour uh, to, to really get that information out. And, you know, we then try to make the best of what we had. We, we recognize that the science and the evidence evolved. And so that's good that CDC, you know, did the right thing to, to make the, the evolution of their guidance. But we also recognize that there were still people and businesses and establishments and local jurisdictions, for example, that, that had a different stance on what they felt should be happening with respect to masks. And so uh, we said, respect the rules of the room. And that was a, a kind of a, a colloquial way of saying, you know, know what's happening in the establishment or the restaurant that you're going to, or the grocery store you're going to. If they say wear a mask, then wear a mask, uh, respect it. If you have a local health officer or a local health department, a local health jurisdiction or community says wear a mask, then by all means, wear the mask and follow those rules. We were going to be supportive of those communities and or businesses that were going to be more uh, wanting to continue with the mask. And we also know that there were people that felt that, um, in essence, more comfortable you know, with wearing a mask. And, and for example, uh, my wife and I, uh, you know, as healthcare providers, I'll tell you that right now we go almost everywhere and it feels really awkward not to have a mask on, even if nobody is around. And so sometimes you just want to have it on because you feel more, you know, at ease. And why I say all this is that this, again, is why it becomes confusing to people who are, uh, to, to your point about unvaccinated. What, what happens when you're unvaccinated, there, there are two things that are occurring. One is that you put yourself at risk. But because there is this uh, oftentimes clustering of behaviors where people who are unmasked or un not getting vaccinated, the, those behaviors sometimes go hand in hand, not always, sometimes go hand in hand. And what happens then is that you can also have mixing of those same people in a cluster, if you will. And that cluster means that you might be more likely to now have different um, uh, types of these uh, virus, the, the same virus come together, but you can have variants. Now, a homegrown variant, the more mixing you have, the more likely or possible ability you have of having homegrown variants. So we're not just thinking about what's happening in the South Africa or what's happening in the UK or Brazil or now India. We're actually even concerned about are there variants here in the, in the US that are homegrown? And why vaccines matter is because if you're effective with those vaccines, you are now, at least so far, the evidence is showing that those vaccines are taking on those variants. But that's not a forever thing. And so we have to, and I don't want people to get confused, right? Oh, well, that Dr. Shaw said, you know, six months ago mm -hmm. that you don't have to worry about it. You know, this is why this has been such a tough battle, because every time we say something today, six months later, if it changes, somebody says, well, why did you tell me something different last six months ago? And, and the issue is because things change. And I think all of us want our our officials, our health officials to also evolve with this pandemic as it evolves. That's the second message. The third message is simply that when we are looking at um, the effectiveness of vaccines, we do know that there is a limitation to the time element. And that if you, for example, were infected with COVID-19, it's a matter of uh, several months, few months where you'll have immunity. If you are uh, with the vaccine, the belief is, right, because these are short, we, we, we have a recent experience with these vaccines, but the likelihood is that you're talking about uh, almost a year of vaccination protection, which means that at some point, 
like a pr healthcare provider like me who got vaccinated back in, in January, that you are now looking at potentially November, December, January, you might be looking at a booster that's coming up, which means that we start the process all over again, which is going to be a challenge. And, and again, right now we're focused on the immediate, but we know that that is mm -hmm. something that may be down the road as well. Totally. No, I thank you for that. I just, I think, um, and I, you and I have talked about this a little bit, one of the challenges of this pandemic, and you just touched on it, and it's a challenge for you, obviously, as a healthcare provider and as the Secretary of Health, but also for me as a journalist, is that it changes, sometimes day to day. Um, I think about this time last year, you know, I'd write a story one week, and then the next week, I might be writing quite literally the opposite or very different, because the science is changing so fast. Um, and I'm curious, you know, from your perspective, do you feel like, um, I don't know if you're surprised or like you sort of expected this, but how quickly do you feel like in the last six months and having to react and change things? Oh, we didn't get enough shipments of this, these doses, so we have to do this. Do you think public health has sort of become more nimble as a result of this? Or do you think that that was always there and this is sort of just like the first like really pandemic test case? Like, I'm curious if this is stretched public health's um, abilities or is sort of showing them off, I guess? You know, it, Ariel, it's interesting. For me, it's kind of tough to answer that question because, as you know, I've, I've been a 20 years uh, ER uh, physician at the, at the, throughout the VA hospital system in Houston. And so it's, it's really, I, uh, I feel like a lot of times my, my career has been about emergencies. And then I think back to Tropical Storm Allison in 2001, uh, Hurricanes Katrina, Rita, Ike, Harvey, um, you know, H1N1, Ebola, Zika, not to mention obviously COVID-19 and chemical events and, you know, plumes of smoke, uh, black smoke over all of Houston that you saw, uh, you know, uh, a couple of years back or all sorts of other challenges that we've had that we don't even think of them as big because the big ones ones were big and these were actually some of the 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 more small smaller ones so i have maybe a different look at how public health should respond and maybe that's one of the reasons that governor Inslee wanted me to you know to be here in the middle of this emergency that it was really a time to be able to come in and be able to say look i don't have all the facts i don't have all the information i don't know all the people i don't know the state i don't know and yet here I am doing everything I can because that's what you do in the emergency department, right? You don't know everything about the individual that's in front of you, the patient. They come in, you sort of take an assessment, you do the best you can. It's not perfect. There are going to be some things that you might miss. There are some things that you have to adjust, but you know that you have a couple of things that really in the emergency department you have to decide, which very, very quickly is a triage of sick enough that they need to be hospitalized or not sick enough that they can go home. Those are really your two options in an emergency department. And that's really what we were doing is that we were doing emergency triage in public health. What was bad enough that we needed to address today because it was a crisis in the midst of this, this horrific pandemic? And what are the things that are happening that are really can, can wait and we can try to get to or will evolve, like you said, over time? And so when I look at all of that, I hope, that my colleagues across the country and even the globe, but across the country especially, are going to be, are, are gonna take COVID-19 as a lesson in why we need to be nimble, why we need to be flexible, why we need to, and those three cornerstone values that I bring in are equity, innovation, engagement, that why we need to bring all those, because that's how you can really take any emergency or any non-emergency and apply a public health lens to it and why we have to be so good at what we do. We have to be the best of the best. We have to have the best technologies. We have to have the, the, the most trained workforce. And ultimately, we have to invest in public health and prevention, which is what we have not as a country done for decades. The reason we got into this hole with COVID-19 mm -hmm. is because we never invested in public health. And we would do it like Ebola happened. And this is a personal experience, I'll tell you. Ebola happened and we were in Texas. And as you know, what happened in Dallas and, you know, the cases in Dallas and in the entire continental United States, we had we had three cases of, of Ebola in, in, in addition to Mr. Duncan, who was at, you know, um, uh, Presbyterian Hospital in Dallas, you had you had you had essentially wiped out Ebola. You, you, you prevented Ebola from taking over the United States. But it's a null hypothesis. When we do our job well, nothing happens. 
And people are like, well, you don't need to invest in public health. So that Ebola funding went away. And then it was time for Zika funding. And Zika was another, right? You know, it was a concern about birth defects related to a mosquito borne disease. And then guess what people, and and especially our policymakers in in DC were looking back at the Ebola dollars and said, well, why don't you use those dollars for Zika funding? Well, Ebola was still raging in West Africa. So you could so so we we constantly have been have been in public health um, uh, robbing Peter to pay Paul constantly. Mm-hmm. And this is a time for us to take a a look at not what I call transactional health, even COVID one and done, but transformational health. What is it truly mm-hmm. going to take to invest in health, not public health? Not health care, but health. And if we truly invest in health, then our capacity and capability is, is stronger. It's better. It's more elevated. It's deeper. So that when the emergency happens, you then don't have to stretch as much for that emergency because guess what? You have capability. And that's the capacity that we need to build. <laughs> that's right. Totally. No, I that leads perfectly into one of my questions I was going to ask later, but I want to ask it now. Um, if I'm if I understand our state budget correctly, public health was funded at record levels this year um, in the in Washington state. And so I'm curious from your perspective, you know, obviously we can't go through the entire list of where you want that budget to go. But if you have a couple high points um, or things that you can think of off the top of your head right now when we're talking about those new sort of investments in public health, where do you think those need to go? Well, I think the one area, it, first of all, it's it's several hundred million, which is, you know, in the biennium, which is fantastic. It's a it's an incredible shot in the arm. And we're talking about vaccines. So, you know, it's a great <laughs> shot in the arm. I, you know, I would say that it's really about ultimately this broad based investment. It, it can't be about one disease or another. It's really about investing in the foundational system and what we call foundational public health services, foundation of what, what really drives everything, the workforce, the technologies, the processes, and also really about the structures and, and how do we take those on. But there are some specific areas. The one area that I, I know you would you would uh, be the first to, to say to me, because you're very good at this, uh, is, is just reminding <laughs> me of the importance the socioeconomic impact of this pandemic on our communities, whether it's adults or children, and and that mental behavioral health, substance abuse, the chronic diseases that have gotten worse. Like not all of us have been able to, including with, you know, all these virtual meetings, not all of us have been able to to go out and exercise and do all sorts of things, or, or our children have been impacted from a mental health crisis standpoint, or we've had, you know, the the real concern around suicides, the concern around illicit substances, the concern around, Mm -hmm. you know, tobacco use, the concern around alcoholism, the concern around other kinds of uh, ill behaviors that ultimately make us be a part of ill communities. We want to be part of healthy communities. And so what I really would like to see is that this investment is a structural investment in a broad based fashion. But it's also not just about infectious diseases, but the real non-infectious diseases that ultimately, guess what? That's what's killing most Americans is not Mm -hmm. Ebola, Zika, and and even COVID-19, although COVID-19 has taken an incredible toll across the country. And yet, when we get beyond COVID-19, it's going to still be diabetes, high blood pressure, heart disease, mental um, and substance abuse related issues, and certainly obesity, cancer. These are the kinds of, and they're not sexy, right? They're not. <laughs> Nobody wants, oh, you know, we prevent it. It's not, you know, if I yeah. go out and say, like, this is, and that's, I think, the challenge of public health. When we do our job, it's largely invisible and people don't see it as being so exciting and they forget why it's so important. I always call it, Ariel, we're the offensive line of the football team. Everybody knows <laughs> Russell Wilson. The quarterback is the healthcare system. And people forget that the offensive line must be strong. And if that offensive line is not strong, then Russell Wilson or the team will not be successful. I've watched enough Seahawks football to understand that the O line is absolutely critical. <laughs> <laughs> um, I um, thank you for that. I, one thing, and you were right about the, you know, the, 
I'm a huge, I talk about social determinants of health more than almost anything else probably on my beat. But one of the things that has really struck me the last year is how important community organizations and, you know, whatever we call them, warm handoffs, trusted partners, community partners, without them, from my perspective, there's, there's, you, it's a way harder thing to get vaccines into arms. It's way harder to get people tested. It's way harder to get people care that they need. Um, is there a place, uh, you know, I'm, I'm curious if you can respond to that a little bit, but also, you know, what you can, what we've learned from investing and listening to community organizations and partners. And what does that look like from your perspective in your role as Secretary of Health going forward? Because I think that this pandemic has sort of, um, I keep calling it, it's sort of shown the fault lines. Obviously communities that were in the fringes or struggled to access care have known these equity inequities have existed the whole time. But I think for the first time, it was in everyone's face. And you were very easy, it was very easy to see in the data, hey, this community is being hit really hard by COVID-19. We need to help them. But to get their help, to get them help, you need to invest in the community organization to get them <laughs> to come get care or get testing. So I'm curious if part of your strategy as the Secretary of Health going forward, and we talk about what's being learned from the pandemic, revolves around um, investing more and like bringing those community organizations and partners to the table early so that we don't just have to call them up during a pandemic, but establishing a relationship with them to build healthier communities. I, I think one of the, the, the best things about, and there haven't been that many great things about this pandemic, and I think all of us would have wished that we never had it so that we wouldn't have to even have this conversation, is that it has been really an opportunity to, to bring partners together. And so a couple of areas that I would just highlight, one is around our public-private partnership through something called the VAC Center, which has really been an opportunity of bringing, you know, the, the Starbucks and the Costco's and the Kaiser Permanentes and the Microsoft's of the world and bringing together and really harnessing the power of that private sector. The other is around equity, our VIX, our vaccine implementation collaboratives that's really been around how do we have dialogue with especially those communities that have been disproportionately impacted by COVID-19, especially around the vaccination process that we were all so focused on. So you have the VAX on the one hand, public-private partnership, the VIX on the other hand with equity lens, taking that together. And I think that really comes together in, in, a, in, a, in a quick example, which is the launch that we, we just sent out uh, today, a, a press release that we launched the Caravans, um, a, an initiative which is, you know, in my mind, the first time DOH has actually had this kind of capacity at a state health agency level, which is these, these vehicles that are going to allow us to actually go into communities and supplement what's happening with local health departments, local health jurisdiction and community, you know, community health providers, but also be very much called in or requested by community based or community rooted organizations that say, look, we're going to have a faith based event We're we're going to be at a church. We're going to be at a at a mosque. We're going to be at a synagogue. We're going to be at a temple on on this day. Could you bring your caravan here? And we would then provide some additional activities related to vaccination efforts. But we don't want it to just be like, you know, a lot of times in health, it's uh, it's kind of drudgery. Uh, we want it to be fun. We want it to be invigorated. We want it to be what I um, had championed previously after Hurricane Harvey was this concept along with our team in Harris County, which was really around the village that you would bring health, but you would have, you know, music and you would have food or you would have, you know, the library there. Or you would have other people. do. There was a dance off. I did. I'm not going to do it again in Washington, but I did a dance off <laughs> with a uh, the, the mascot for the soccer team. And, you know, I will tell you that that's the kind of stuff that really at the end of the day gets people jazzed up. And if in the process getting jazzed up means that they're going to get vaccinated, then it's a win for us. And a win for, when I mean us, I don't mean GOH, win for us as in all of us, the entirety of the state. So that's where this is an example of public-private partnership, an example of, of the equity work coming together with a specific uh, initiative. And why this is important is that this is what we need to do to create synergy and energy around health and well-being. And so that's what I'm looking to do is for us to really remember that, as you said, 
COVID-19 did not start these health inequities or disparities or differences in health outcomes, but it certainly just took it to a different level, to an, a level that has just been awful. We've got to absolutely look at those structural and social determinants of health. We know that racism is part of that. We know that there is the, the housing and transportation and all these other social factors like, like jobs and unemployment, et cetera. But we can't stop there. We also then have to take the, the, the theory of it and operationalize it. And the caravan concept is that one that we just launched today, which is really how do we how do we go about? Well, technically we launched it yesterday, but we sent the press release out today. So uh, you know, it's an opportunity to do just that. Totally. Do you envision those caravans? Uh, you know, I'm imagining a world beyond the pandemic, perhaps 2025. I mean, do you imagine those caravans still existing, but maybe taking childhood vaccines or I'm thinking holistic public health STI testing or flu shots or whatever. Is that is this the model by which that you're thinking of Department of Health beginning to sort of engage again um, with communities and sort of be accessible to your point to um, community organizations that could call DOH and say, hey, we don't have a nurse or a doctor, but we are having this event. And like if you'd like to come and like do childhood shots like that'd be great because like school starts in a week that is that the type of am I understanding that capability you're absolutely right so you know we so think about it from an emergency response standpoint absolutely COVID COVID vaccines but we've got wildfires mm -hmm. We've got potential for landslides. We've got tsunamis. We've got ability to have uh, flood events. We've got, uh, you know, we've got uh, a, a really bad snow events or ice events or cold events, loss of power. There are so many different places where there is a capacity and capability that a, that a state health agency, I believe, should have. And COVID vaccine is the reason to get it started. But that's the short piece of it. That's the immediate part of this. The long term, and Ariel, I if I could just take a soundbite in what you said and just highlight <laughs> that for the for 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 our work moving forward, that's exactly right. Because again, it can't be COVID and done. It can't be a one time and we're finished. This has to be leveraging all those partners, all the know how, everything that we learned. And not just saying we're finished and let's move on business as usual. Let's now leverage it so we can create healthy opportunities for the future and also build that capacity within an organization like ours. That's what this is about. And so, yes, absolutely. It would be ready for emergencies, a whole host of other emergencies. That's why it makes total sense for emergency uh, funding to be able to pay for this. But it's also dual use that while you, you're not going to have an emergency every moment, that while you're waiting for that other emergency, you can use it for other reasons or other activities, including, as you said, other immunizations or chronic disease prevention, oral health, you know, environmental health. There are so many other places where we could actually go out and be able to utilize this. What we did in, in, in Harris County was really interesting. We actually went, worked with a local museum. We created a mobile mosquito museum the triple M. And so it was like a four, four <laughs> wheels and it was a museum. And, it, and think about the equity approach, because the thought was that there are a lot of kids in our communities that did because of transportation issues, couldn't get to a museum, but we still wanted to teach them about mosquito prevention, about how to drain water out of their you know backyards, how to get their parents, mm. you know, to, to be part of the solution. And so we would take it to various, you know, activities that were going on in communities, especially disproportionately impacted or communities of color and you would park this van and and uh, not van it was in a big rv and you would have kids that would actually now be able to go through and almost do a mobile mosquito museum where they would learn about mosquitoes and lifespan and and what you know how they how they breed and what are the kinds of things you can do to try to you know try to get rid of them and all the other activities and guess what they would walk out educated that's an equity approach that's the kind of approach that to me is about innovation it's about obviously equity and it's about engagement. So those three cornerstone values of equity, innovation, engagement are all encapsulated in a caravan concept. And that's what I'm really excited about. And again, the, the hats off go to our team. I mean, our team, Errol, if you knew in two days, 
we will be commemorating 500 days of response in this state. One of the first, you know, the the the, the longest responses in, in this in the in the country because Washington is where you had the first case in the continental United States. 500 days. Yep. Our team is they're 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 fatigued. They're tired, but they have an incredible spirit. They still smile and they still are, are energized and they still know that we're, we're making progress. And what I'm hoping and what I've been doing for the last five, six months is to try to bring new ideas to a team that's honestly fantastic. And that same team has now embraced those ideas. And guess what? That's what the caravan concept has come out of. Hmm. That's really awesome. Um, I hope uh, yeah, I pretty hope cool. community groups... <laughs> Yeah, I hope community groups can take advantage of that because I think that that's just like a, you know, a, again, a, a combination and a thing that I keep seeing at vaccine clinics is you have to have the community buy in and community support for an event. And then if you can supply, you know, the testing or the vaccines or whatnot, it's a really nice sort of meet in the middle. But frankly, like taking I what I've witnessed in the last couple months, and I guess this is sort of like full circle back to the next step of the vaccine campaign is taking the vaccine to people and making it convenient to them works. <laughs> um, and so I, you know, I'm, I'm big galaxy brain. I'm like, oh, like that probably works for everything. You know, like if you, if you are offering someone a preventative care or even like actual care, but it's convenient for them and it's brought to them, um, you know, that's a way to engage more people. So I think that that's a really, um, you know, interesting takeaway from the pandemic um, that I'm excited about and excited to write about as a healthcare reporter. Um, thank you so much for your time, Dr. Shaw. I will. I would love to ask one last question, if that's okay. Um, and it's sort of a not fair one to end on because we could have talked the entire time about this. But as we're sort of um, coming out of this pandemic a little bit more, we have you know half our population vaccinated. We're sort of getting back to things. Um, the sort of dual crises that were happening behind the scenes of mental health and um, substance use disorders um, continue to sort of rage on. And I'm curious from your perspective, you know, if you can touch on a little bit of what the work um, the Department of Health and your vision um, is going to do to sort of work to get resources and help to people. I know a lot of our mental health resources and substance use programs right now are really slammed and really busy. Um, and those crises really haven't um, stopped just because of the pandemic. And so I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about um, the department's work, and I'm not sure if that's um, going to be with some of that new funding or just sort of refocused energies as we go forward with this year, but I'd love for you to touch on that a little bit too. Yeah, you know, Ariel, this is really, again, it's not about where we are today. It's about where we're going to need to be moving forward. And this is really about, again, I I, I don't want to overuse the term, but not it's not about transactional health, which is a, a one, you know, one type of disease state and done. It's transformational health. It's mm -hmm. how, what are the kinds of things that we're really looking at doing for the future? And we know mental health, and behavioral health, substance abuse, these and, and chronic disease prevention, frankly, are, are really the areas where we do see this being so critical to the work that we do. And what we need to do is be able to have a, um, um, a strategy uh, so that it's not just about, uh, again, being done with, with um, just the same old, same old. Uh, we've mm -hmm. got to really be thinking about uh, different approaches to existing problems that have gotten worse, mm -hmm. frankly. I mean, this pandemic has made these things worse. They they have not made them better. They've made them worse. And 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 it's even you know I worry because it's made it worse not just because of the problem, but because of there are there are we have politicized things such that um, I think I said this a, a long time ago, but I remember you know I, I you know 20 years of 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 being in the emergency department and taking care of our nation's veterans, and I, I don't think. And, and I've had some really challenging patient encounters. I've never had a patient say to me, doc, I'm not going to take your blood pressure medicine because I just don't believe it works. I'm not going to take it because mm -hmm. uh, someone told me not to take it. They, 
you know, and and, I, and I, I'm not saying a paternalistic way of addressing it. It's 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 saying, look, this is to help you. That's what my job has been. That's what my career has been built on is is to save lives and to help people through very difficult situations. I've had my own situations with family members who have who have had health issues or challenges. I've had you know uh, family members uh, and friends who have gone through some very difficult times. Um, my own dad. Uh, in, in our home fell and had a, you know, um, multiple bleeds and was in the ICU nine times before he passed in, in 2018. And so there was this, this real recognition of what people go through. It's not a theoretical, it's a real practical what people go through. And I yet have never seen it politicized like we've seen this pandemic politicized. And so what I worry about is that when we come out of this pandemic, and we will, and I know we will, and we're gonna come out of this sooner than later, is I don't want it to have spillover effect into other things that we're trying to do. Environment, mm -hmm. chronic disease prevention like diabetes and cancer and high blood pressure, the, the maternal child health, uh, the disease control mm -hmm. or infectious disease, other kinds of behavioral health. We have to have everybody working together because that's ultimately how we're going to be successful. And COVID has shown us a glimpse of what happens when we work together, but it's also shown us what happens when we don't. And I don't want us to mm -hmm. see that. I want us to be successful and, and see health and well-being really the way that it rides the day for, for our communities across the entirety of the state of Washington. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for that. I uh, I didn't I didn't want to end on a, a, a downer note, but I also just know that that's... Um, I think that's top of mind for a lot of people um, and just from readers that I hear from. And so I really appreciate you addressing that. Um, thank you so much for our excellent conversation. Um, thank you for going a little over time and for uh, being patched in from Texas. I appreciate it a lot. Um, if you are listening live, um, you can rewatch this recording if you so desire online at spokesman.com. And thank you so much. We'll see you next time. Ariel, this is great. And thank you for everything you've been doing throughout this pandemic and your media <laughs> colleagues across. So I really appreciate it. So look forward to doing this again.